thank you very much for uh, inviting me to speak here. I'm very honored, uh, and uh, I'm sorry that I'm not able to speak to you in Turkish. Uh, the reason that uh, I and a number of other scientists were here in Urfa uh, was because we all need archaeologists, other scientists, and the public. We need to uh, rethink our ideas about the Neolithic uh, because Gobekli Tepe is turning the world upside down. So first of all, I will talk a little bit about the original idea of the Neolithic, often called the Neolithic Revolution. And then I will say a little bit of, about what we have learned in 50 years of research. And then very quickly, I'll come to what has changed. And obviously, I will not speak about Gobekli Tepe, but the other sites that of, the, of this period, which also give us problems. And at the end, I will say a little bit about how perhaps we should be rethinking the idea of the Neolithic Revolution. First, just a few words about the technical terms that people, archaeologists, use for the period that we're talking about. Geologists on the left-hand side, they were first in the field, and they um, defined a two, uh, the two most recent geological periods, the Holocene, which is the time we live, and the Pleistocene, or the Ice Age the period before. When archaeologists began to get interested, they found um, flint tools and uh, human remains in Pleistocene deposits, in geological terms, in Pleistocene deposits. So they made the word, they coined the word Paleolithic, Old Stone Age. And uh, in the Holocene period, the Neolithic, the New Stone Age. And of course, archaeologists have subdivided the period and we now know that the early part of the Neolithic is without pottery. So again, archaeologists invented the word aceramic, without pottery. And we know from radiocarbon dating that uh, the beginning of the Holocene and the beginning of the Neolithic is dated to 9600 BC. And Gobekli Tepe and most of the other sites that I shall talk about belong in the first part of that period, sometimes called the PPNA. That's the area with the red ring around it on the screen. So that is the period that, uh, that is, is causing us to rethink. The man who started this back in the 1920s and 1930s was Professor Gordon Child, who uh, founded the Department of Archaeology in my own university, the University of Edinburgh. He was a, uh, an Australian socialist uh, and he applied a Marxist analysis to prehistory. So he proposed that the uh, beginnings of agriculture in the Neolithic period uh, was a profound social and economic revolution like the Industrial Revolution uh, in the 19th century, a profound social and economic transformation. Writing in the 1930s and the 1940s, his work was very popular and very widely read his information at that time, as you can guess from this old kind of map, was very poor. It was mostly theory, but my point is that it has become embedded in everybody's thoughts that the Neolithic is the beginnings of agriculture. This is where we need to rethink. Of course, Gordon Child sought the beginnings in the Near East, but he sought them in the great river valleys where the first civilizations appeared. After the Second World War, an American archaeologist, Robert Braidwood, decided to test Gordon Child's theory in the field, using archaeology as the field laboratory. So he first looked, he first asked scientists, botanists, zoologists, where should I look? Where should we look? And what they said is, if you want to find wild wheat, wild barley, wild sheep, wild goat, all the things which the first farmers used, then you should not look in the river valleys, Mesopotamia, southern Iraq, Egypt. You should look in what is on, on this map, which is a rainfall map, the middle blues, yeah, uh, are the, where areas of moderate rainfall and where it is hilly. Around here, for example, around Ulfa, where there is, it is hilly, and today it is showing us you have moderate rainfall. Uh, and uh, in 10,000, 12,000 years ago, this is where you would expect to find wild sheep, wild goat, wild wheat, wild barley. So now botanists can map for us uh, where you would find 
the wild wheat, the different kinds of wild wheat and the wild barley. Uh, uh, and you can see a fairly modern map there. Or where you would expect to find a, a wild goat 12,000 years ago. And the smaller area in West Iran is where, we current, where pre at present we believe goat was first domesticated. And we can do the same for sheep. The zoologists can do the same for sheep. And the area in the smaller um, um, circle is the area where it is now believed that sheep were first domesticated. And you could add pig and cattle. This, this area here in southeast Turkey, north Syria, is the key area for domestication of animals. So what do we now know ab about the beginnings of uh, farming? Uh, we, we now know that uh, before 20,000 years ago, people were already taking wild wheat and barley and storing it. So for more than 10,000 years, people were using wild wheat, wild barley. But then from about 9,500, exactly the time of Gebekli Tepe, they were beginning to cultivate. And the domesticated forms of these crops as we would recognize them as farming crops, uh, begin to emerge after another 1,000 years, 8,500 BC, the first fully domesticated. In terms of animals, from 40,000 years ago, we can see a steady decline of the larger animals. After 20,000 years ago, the large animals, most of the wild bulls, deer, are gone. And certainly in the southern Levant, Israel, Jordan, people are concentrating on gazelle, which is a sm quite small animal. And more and more, they concentrate on catching tortoises, hunting fox, hare, birds, fish, frogs. And these animals are the sheep, the goat, cattle, and pigs are domesticated around 8,500 BC which again, after the high period, the main period of, of uh, Gebekli Tepe. This is some uh, new research uh, from a site, Jeff al Ahmar in Syria, very close to the, on the Euphrates, uh, uh, very close to uh, Karkamish, but on the Syrian side. And what the graph shows is that uh, over time, during the life of the, the village of Jeff al Ahmar, from 9,500 BC to about 8,500 BC, the barley is getting fatter. So it is becoming domesticated. And this is the same study, but on a different, on a kind of wheat. And again, the same thing. The grains are becoming slowly fatter. So for the first time, we can see that the process is very slow. It takes many hundreds of years, even thousands of years, and it reaches full farming after 8,500 BC, maybe by 7,500 BC. But of course, we have new discoveries. Gobekli Tepe is perhaps the most dramatic, but we have, uh, um, before the, the establishment of farming, we now know of settlements, not the camps of mobile hunter-gatherers, but settlements which are not simple villages. At these sites, we find architecture, which I say goes beyond the need for shelter. And we have many symbolic representations. So, so Gobekli Tepe is not entirely isolated. As well as new discoveries, we have new thinking. A number of archaeologists, I am one, think that focusing on the changes in climate and the changes in the way people obtain their food uh, is something like environmental determinism. And many of us archaeologists who work in this region on the Neolithic have been very influenced by the work of a French archaeologist, Jacques Covin. In the 1990s, uh, Jacques Covin published a book, the title in French, Naissance des divinités, Naissance de l'agriculture, the birth of divinities, the birth of the gods, followed by the beginnings of agriculture. So he is putting something before the beginnings of agriculture. Right? He talks of the birth of the gods. Sadly, Jacques Covin died in 2001. And uh, in the 1990s and in the 
early years of this century, we have seen an explosion of ideas in neuroscience, cognitive psychology, and evolutionary psychology. Uh, we have also become, it has become clear that we have not just small villages, but also some settlements with very large populations in many hundreds or even thousands. Some of these settlements are clearly not just a cluster of small buildings, they show a structured organization, a structured plan. We see quite extraordinary treatment of houses. They are not simply a place to shelter, they are treated quite elaborately. And especially in this area, in southeast Turkey and the northernmost Syria, we find settlements which have public buildings. For example, at uh, Chayanu uh, Tepesa near Diabaka, the settlement has uh, uh, some very large houses around a central square. And then beyond the large houses, much more ordinary houses. It's a very organized settlement. And there in red is the public area at the heart of the village. What you are looking at there is the foundations supporting a raised floor. But when it became necessary to replace the superstructure, the mud brick and mud roof, they replaced the foundations as well, and they build the new foundations exactly on top of the old foundations. They retain the sense of place. What I would emphasize is we're seeing the, uh, the people do things which are not strictly necessary, uh, and they do them repeatedly. If we look briefly at the site of Chatalhyuk, uh, the famous site of Chatalhyuk, it's, it's quite a lot later in the Neolithic, but if we look at Chatalhyuk, we see that they have very elaborate houses with a living room and then storage rooms to the right. They enter the room through a, by a ladder coming from the roof. There's not a doorway. Uh, but uh, uh, they're very elaborate structures. In the corner of the living room, you see that they constructed a platform and around it they put the skulls of wild bulls. And you can see on the wall, uh, a lump on the wall, that is the skull of a goat which is modeled into the wall. And under the floor, in that corner, there will be burials of the, of the dead members of the household. So the house, you can imagine, becomes a monument to the family. Every year, or perhaps every few months, the walls receive a new coat of plaster, and sometimes the, the plaster is painted Sometimes the painting is very elaborate scenes, sometimes it's much more simple. In this case, it's just prints of the hand. The plaster is very thin, but they have counted up to 700 coats of plaster in one house. Yeah? So it's a repeated performance. And now I want to turn to communal buildings or public buildings. And uh, um, we're looking at the center of uh, the village of Jeff al Ahmar on the Euphrates in the north of Syria. And at the center of the settlement, among the houses, there is a, an underground building, a circular underground building. To give you an idea of scale, this is about seven meters diameter, three meters deep. So to build this, first they have to dig a hole which is seven meters across, three meters deep. This has to be a communal activity. In those small square cells, the botanists found that people stored lentils in one, barley in another. Yeah? So this seems to be the, the food store for the whole village. What happened in the open area, we don't know. But at the end of the life of this building, a headless corpse of a young woman, I'm very sorry, <laughs> the headless corpse of a young woman was thrown on the floor. The roof supports were taken out and the roof collapsed and was burnt. And then the hole was filled deliberately. So again, seven meters by three meters deep, completely refilled. In another part of the settlement, a second communal building was built. It is, again, underground and very large, but this one is different in plan. It has a platform 
at the base of the walls. And again, at the end of its life, the roof is collapsed, it is filled in. A Syrian colleague excavated a similar site, also on the Euphrates, close by Tel Abar, uh, and he found uh, a, a similar circular building with a platform around it, subterranean, or underground, with a platform around, and in the platform, the bones of wild cattle. And the building had some uh, inscribed stones, uh, and you can see one perhaps a little more clearly. That's it. And you can see that uh, there are incised designs, or designs cut into many of the stones used in the building. Now, the, the last of these sites for the public building, also on the, the Euphrates in North Syria, there's a group of these. Uh, they were salvage excavations on a, a dam, rather like Atatürk Dam or Birijik Dam, but in the Tishreen Dam in, in Syria. This site is called Jade. Uh, and, and again, uh, at a slightly later date than the other buildings we've seen, but around 8,500 BC, a large circular underground building, it has three short walls which come towards the center. And the sides of these short walls are covered in painted decoration, as you can see. Come on, come on. So I want to say, I want to look at the question, why did it happen then and why did it happen here? And I'm going to set it in a, a long-term context. Homo sapiens emerges in Africa about 200,000 years ago. Around 100,000 years ago, Homo sapiens is expanding out of Africa into Asia. Before 40,000 years ago, Homo sapiens has reached Australia. And also after 40,000 years ago, he went to Europe. But it did not leave Africa empty. In other words, what we are seeing is an amazing expansion of population. When Homo sapiens reaches this part of the world, Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, Southeast Turkey, maybe Northern Iraq, but uh, certainly this area, he finds a zone which is very rich in resources. I've already mentioned sheep, goat, cattle, pig, but you can add in gazelle, uh, deer, many animals to hunt. We've seen wheat, barley, um, lentils, chickpea, peas, beans. It is the richest resource zone in the world for a hunter-gatherer. So it is only natural that population grew more dense here, more, we have more dense population in this region, growing population. But there is a problem for people because uh, when population begins to become uh, of a certain density, it becomes very difficult for humans to manage. And I want to turn to this idea of the social brain the author of this uh, uh, theory is uh, Robin Dunbar. He is the man at the back of that picture. Uh, and uh, he, he has worked with, uh, he was not able to come to our workshop, but he is part of our, our, our research group. Mm. Uh, and his idea about the, I just put the title of a, of a very amusing book he, he wrote, yeah? Uh, I don't know if it's been grooming, translated. Grooming. Grooming is... Uh, um, like what, what chimpanzees do when you see chimpanzees? Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. oh. Um. Um, but his, uh, his uh, theory is that uh, um, humans have evolved the size of their brain, where some animals evolve speed so that they can escape, other animals evolve strength so that they can fight. Humans have evolved big brains, yeah? And he says that big, they have evolved big brains so that they can live in big groups. Homo sapiens has a brain which is much larger than is necessary for managing our body. And when you look at the parts of the brain which are specially human, they are in the outer part of our brain, which is where we understand... Dış, dış which is where we understand language, where we think, where we can understand social relations, where we can have our emotions, where we, where we feel emotionally for music, etc., etc. 
so Homo sapiens is particularly evolved for, for uh, living in, in, uh, in close social groups, but Robin Dunbar's research indicates that the maximum size of group that we can manage with our brain is 150. But what we are seeing at the time of Gobekli Tepe, Jaf al Akma, and the other sites is settlements which are beginning to grow into hundreds, yeah? and networks of settlements who come together to create a site like Gobekli Tepe, which must number many thousands beyond the physical limit of the of natural the limit of the brain. So in my view, this is the revolution of uh, building the cultural capacity to create large communities. Building the cultural capacity to create large communities, which need collective memory. So that, for example, you who live in Urfa know, share collective memory about the, the history of Urfa, the history of your families, the history of your community. At a larger level, you who are Turks, yeah? You, you are part of the community which is the Turkish nation, yeah? And you commemorate it in ceremonies, you have a collective memory. Uh, so the capacity to build a sense of identity and to build a sense of community identity is very sophisticated, very abstract. The, the ability to, for us, we think nothing of it because it's, we are born to it. But what we are doing when we say, I am from Urfa and I am proud of Urfa, yeah? You don't mean the buildings or the streets, you mean the community. That's very abstract, yeah? okay. it's, it's not concrete, it's very, it's very sophisticated. Durum. So I just want to point to the anthropologist Anthony Cohen, and I'll just mention that he also was at Edinburgh University, it's a good place. <laughs> and uh, he has a book, The Symbolic Construction of Community. He's arguing that the ability of, of communities to build a, this community identity is symbolic and it requires constant reworking. Yeah? So if you turn to a, a social psychologist like Paul Connaughton, he will say that societies use commemorative ceremonies, national days, funerals, marriages, all sorts of things to construct community, whether it's the community of the family or the community of the town or the city or the community of the whole nation. In English, the word commemorate was memory, and the com at the front means together. Yeah? It's, it's memory that you share together. Now, psychologists and anthropologists talk of ceremonies and rituals, uh. but as an archaeologist, we can see also the signs, the little figures, the sculptures, the buildings, the whole settlements, which signify community. So around the time of Gobekli Tepe, communities in this part of the world, for the first time in human history, solved the problem of how to build a community which was more than 150, that is hundreds, thousands, and in our time, millions. And that is the revolution. That is what makes modern humans different from all the Paleolithic and all of human um, evolution. One or two thousand years later, when they had developed full farming, then this way of life, based on farming, spreads quite rapidly. This is a map of the spread across Europe. The darker colors are early, the lighter colors are later. From a different source, this map is mapping increasing density of population in the Neolithic in Europe. So you can see the same thing happening in Europe as, as was happening here before, that not only do farmers spread, but they become very dense, as they do here. They have learned, they know how to do it. And from a very recent piece of research, this is a, an analysis of the expansion of the family of Indo-European languages, the languages like the English I speak and the German that Klaus speaks, uh, like uh, the languages of the Hittites and the Luvians. So the spread of the way of life which was evolved here links me, who lives there, with Professor Siddharth, who also speaks an Indo-European language, yeah? And it all comes from here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. Well done.
What's the oldest Indo-European uh, language has been found? Well, they estimate about seven. Uh, they, they, the study estimates uh, that uh, uh, the in Anatolia, right at the heart, uh, is where the um, Indo-European languages emerged, about nine and a half thousand years ago. Yeah, nine and a half, ten thousand years ago. So, and this study was conducted on using software which is used for analyzing viruses, which as they spread, they also evolve. Yeah, and as languages spread, they evolve. So they used this virus software to analyze Euro Indo-European languages. If the, if they estimate at Chatel Hyuk that there were six or eight thousand people living there. Yeah. They don't have a belediere, they don't have a mayor, they don't have a valley, they don't have police, they don't have judges. But if they don't have those things, which is what we use in order to live together, then they must work together very closely. And the anthropologists tell us one way to do this is to share ceremonies, share stories, myths, and the psychologists tell us to share memory. He's asking about this is not a settlement site. So the, 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 the Klaus Schmidt, which is going to speak just in a m moment, uh, says this c c could be a r ritual place, the, the ceremony place. So uh, what do you think about, uh, especially on that subject? I agree with everything that Professor Schmidt says. No, seriously. <laughs> From my perspective, uh, yes, Gebekli Tepe is not a, not a normal settlement. Yeah? It is some kind of central place. It cannot be, you, you've seen the place, it cannot be built by a few people from a small village. It yeah, must be by a, a huge collaboration. We see shared cultural elements between Gobekli Tepe and, for example, Jeff Al Ahmar, the underground building. So we, we see shared cultural practices, yeah? And they're not practical, they're, they're symbolic. And we also know that over this whole region, people were exchanging things like obsidian, marine shells, malachite. And many of these things are not valuable for ordinary use, yeah? because they only have a very small amount of obsidian here. Mm. So exchanging them and sharing them is saying, we have the same values as you. We like serpentine like you. We like malachite like you. Right, thank you very much. So I, uh, I would like to introduce Klaus Schmidt now with uh, his wife, Chidam Schmidt. She's going to translate us for, uh, for us. Again, thank you very much for doing this for us, Chidam Adam.